may be seated. Well, Merry Christmas and Bon Natale. For the last several weeks, we have been lighting the four candles of Advent. And we've been celebrating the themes of each of those Sundays, the hope, the joy, the peace, the love that Christ brings. And so I'm going to relight those four candles tonight, and then I'm also going to light the white candle that signifies Christ and his purity. Well, and welcome to our Christmas Eve service here at Aviano Baptist Church. If you're new with us, I'm Barry Cole. I'm the pastor here. And on behalf of the Aviano Baptist Church community, I want to say a very special welcome to you if this is your first time worshiping with us. When you came in, you should have gotten a little white envelope. And inside that, there's just a bunch of information about our church and different ministries. And so feel free to flip through that and see if there's any, any ministries that you want to get connected to. Also inside that envelope, there is an obnoxiously yellow little slip that says, tell us about yourself. And so if you would take an opportunity through the course of the service tonight, there's a pen in that, in that envelope as well. So take an opportunity while we're here tonight and just help us get to know you. Fill that out. And then after the service, just drop it in one of the offering plates on the way out the door when the service concludes. We've got a brief service tonight as we just have come together to celebrate the birth of our Lord. We'll have some time singing some very familiar songs. And we'll have some families that will help us with scripture readings. We'll spend a little bit of time in the word. And then at the end of the service, we're going to turn all the lights off, light all of those candles, and end our time together by singing Silent Night. So we're glad you're here. We're glad we have the opportunity just to worship and celebrate our Lord's birth tonight. And I just want to wish you one more time a very Merry Christmas. And so as we, as we continue in our worship service, I'm going to ask our first family to come up and do the Old Testament scripture reading. This is our scripture of hope, and the Mathers family is going to come and share with us Psalm 33, verses 18 through 22. Psalms 33, verses 18 through, 18 through 22. But the eyes of the Lord are on those, who him, on those who hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and keep him alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Please stand and join us in our next two songs. Shall 
for our New Testament reading tonight, our scripture of joy. I'm going to ask Mike and McKay Kingry and their family to come up and lead us in reading Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 14. Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. There were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were very afraid. But the angel said to them, Listen, do not fear, for I bring you good news of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a company of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Give glory to God in heaven and on earth. Let there be peace to the people who please God. Great job. Okay. Please stand and join us in the next two songs.
I mentioned on Facebook the last couple of days that at tonight during this service, we're going to take up a special offering for our Moldova Mission Project. And we've done that every year for the last several years, and most of the last several years, we've sent a team then to Moldova to carry out some work there. And I've got some pictures here I want to kind of talk to you, can I talk through it and sort of show you what we've done there and the work that has been accomplished in that country. This year, probably because of COVID, we're not going to be able to make the trip, but we still want to be able to minister to that and bless that community there. Moldova, if you didn't know it, is the poorest country in Europe. Um, and the average income in the country is the equivalent of about 300 euro a month. And the average person in the village that we work with, they, they, they live on a government pension of about 1,200 Moldovan lei, which is about 35 euro a month. And with that, they have to buy all of their necessities. They also have to buy firewood for their homes. Most of their homes have just a little wood-burning stove, and they use that to heat their homes. They use that, in many cases, to cook their meals. And so the work that we have done primarily has been collecting money and sending it ahead to the church that we work with there in the village of Krihana Vecchie. And then when we take the team there, we'll help deliver that firewood and we'll do some other things. And these are some of the pictures, of some of the things that we do. When we're delivering the firewood, we go to their homes, we make home visits, and we're not just bringing the firewood. In some cases, we're bringing bags of food to the more needy families. And then we also have an opportunity to sit with them and to share the gospel. Throughout the course of the week, we have several evangelical services. At the church, we'll have several church services throughout the villages there, plus the the pastor that we work with will set this up and really this happens in Moldova I wish it could happen other places we'll have an, an evangelical service in the community business leaders politicians doctors lawyers come to that we have an opportunity to share the gospel there as well we also have a youth ministry a time we minister to the teenagers they come from the local villages around about a hundred teenagers will pack out that little church We'll have some, let's we'll see some volleyball tournament down there at the bottom. We'll have some fun teenager kind of things, and then we'll have an opportunity to minister to them as well. And then every day after school, we have a children's ministry. 35, 40 kids will come. We'll have an opportunity to share God's love with them as well throughout the course of the week. And then this is sort of the big project we do while we're there. You see that pile of firewood there in the picture on the, on the left. You're right, on the right. Um, that is one load of firewood, about 5,000 euro worth of firewood, and we typically will send that amount twice. So that big yard uh, full of firewood will do that twice. They chop it up there in the, in the yard, and then we have an opportunity just to deliver it out to the homes. Can you advance to the next slide? And I'm not advancing anymore. Just some more pictures of firewood delivery. Go ahead to the next one. There's some pictures of our team delivering the wood, and then one more. And then to go to the one after that. This year, of course, because uh, uh, the other thing they do there is, is a couple of years ago, the church built a foster home. And that picture in the center of that big yellow building is the foster home the church built just behind the church building. They built that with donated labor, donated material. But orphans are a big problem in Moldova. Alcoholism is a huge problem, and many parents have succumbed to that. A lot of parents have left the country uh, just to find work, and so orphans are a huge problem, and so they built this foster home. There is a foster family that lives there, and they have several foster kids that they have. Several families in our church are sending money on a regular basis to support that, and some of the money that we send as a church goes to support that ministry as well. <clears throat> One more slide, Anna. And then, of course, this year, COVID hit that village hard. Um, Health care is not great in Moldova, um, and, you know, and, and they don't have great sanitary conditions. And so COVID has hit them hard. Jobs are, are sp uh, scarce and hard to come by anyway. Um, and so they've been hit very hard with that. So with some of the money we sent, uh, the church there back, bagged up some food bags and delivered them. And that's some pictures of the, the COVID food delivery response that they had this year. And so what we're asking you to do tonight, go to the last slide, Anna. What we're asking you to do tonight is to just pray about how you can be involved in that project. And so we're going to have an opportunity here in just a minute. The praise team is going to lead us in one more song. And as they do, there are offering plates around the sanctuary, two up in the front and two in the back. And so if you feel the Lord leading you to give to that Moldova mission work, while we're singing this last song, O Holy Night, just go to one of those offering plates and drop your offering in that and be a blessing to those that are more, that are more in need uh, and need our blessing this year at Christmas time. So let's stand together as we sing that. As the Lord leads you, just drop an offering to one of those plates.
tonight and I want to thank you if you brought cookies tonight I mentioned on Facebook earlier in the week that we're collecting some cookies after the service we're going to take them to some of the families that are stuck quarantined in TLF over the Christmas holidays and so thank you if you brought some of those if you can stick around to help with the delivery of that we're going to circle up out here in the fellowship hall after the service organize ourselves real quick and then go and drop those off so if you can stick around for that thank you for doing that as well I also wanted to mention that um, there is a cry room right out this door and to the right. If your littles get a little bit um, squirmy and you're uncomfortable with them being in here um, because they're squirmy, it doesn't bother me, it doesn't bother us any, but I know sometimes it bothers mom and dad. So if you want to take them over there, the service is being live streamed into the cry room. So if you want to use that as well, that's available. A couple of years ago, Forbes magazine published a list of the 10 greatest Christmas movies. I have no idea the criteria that they used for the list. They got it right in some cases. There were some movies on that list you would expect to see on a list of the 10 greatest Christmas movies. A Christmas Carol made the list. You'd expect to see that. Miracle on 34th Street made the list. You'd expect that. White Christmas made the list. But then the list takes an unexpected turn. Gremlins somehow made the list of top 10. I saw one head nod up and down like that. should have been on the list. Die Hard made the list. Now, see now, I know that some of you are die-hard, die-hard fans, so you absolutely think that I thought it would be on that list, but, you know, a, a gun-toting Bruce Willis aside, every Christmas movie promises to tell us something, and that is the true meaning of Christmas. And they all focus around family gatherings and restored relationships. And it's true. Families gather together more at Christmas than at any other time of year. And that's a tremendous blessing, an opportunity that, that we absolutely cherish. And I think especially this year, because we've not been able to do it and we've not been able to get together. So it's something we especially cherish. And as you look around, you notice that people are nicer at Christmas time. They're more generous, they're more giving. People are just in general nicer around Christmas. And in non-pandemic years, we gather together a whole lot more at Christmas time. And if the movies are to be believed, that's what it's all about. That's all there is, just us getting together, being nicer, and, and restoring relationships. But tonight I want to ask you to consider something. Is that really what it's all about? Is that really what Christmas is all about? 
I mean, did God really go to all that trouble with the angels and the virgin who was pregnant with a child and the star? I'm so disappointed we didn't get to see the star of Bethlehem the other night because of the clouds, but the, the angels and the, the, the virgin and the star and the manger and the magi. Did God really go to all that trouble just so for a few weeks out of the year we'd be the kind of people we're supposed to be? Or is it something more? Is there some greater meaning? I'm going to ask you to take your Bible out and turn to the book of John, fourth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 3 is where we're going to be tonight, very briefly, as we just spend a few minutes in the Word of God tonight. John chapter 3 will be in verses 16 through 18, and I like to pull out, when I preach, I like to pull out what I call the big idea. The main theme. What's the big thought here? And here's what I think the big idea is. That God's motivation for sending Jesus, His motivation for Christmas, was far more than us mending fences and far more than us being nice to one another. So you've got your Bibles open, John chapter 3. Just follow along as I read those three verses, verses 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God didn't send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Would you pray with me tonight? Father, thank You for Jesus. Thank you that we can celebrate his birth this time of year. Thank you we have good reason to. And Father, as we spend time in your word and and explore that and look at those reasons, Lord, I just pray that this would be a blessed time together tonight. Lord, we pray for your blessing on it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I realize that these are not verses that you usually hear at Christmas time. Luke chapter 2, right? We heard that read just a moment ago. You expect that at Christmas time. Isaiah chapter 9, maybe, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. You expect that at Christmas time. This is a little bit of an unusual verse, I understand, for a Christmas Eve service. And those other verses are important because they tell us what and who and how. But I think when we look at John's gospel, these verses in particular, we see the other question, why? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Why do we have reason? to celebrate Christmas. And I want to just think about some of those reasons tonight. First reason is this, God loves us. That's why we celebrate. That's why we have Christmas. That's why we have reason to rejoice, because God loves us. Look again at verse 16. He doesn't just say, for God loved the world. For God so loved the world. And God's love is not because we've earned it. It's not because we've been good people. It's not because we've done all the right things. It's not because you've been really, really good this year. That's not why God loves us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says that God is love. And it's not just what He does. It's, it's a critical part of who He is. It's part of His character, part of His nature that God is love. And because of that, he desires a real relationship with everyone he's created. By the way, that's you and me. And he desires a real and personal and intimate relationship. But listen, though God desires that, and he wants to have that personal relationship with you and I, though he desires that, there is something that stands in our way. Something that stands between us and Him, a wedge that is between us and God, and the Bible calls that wedge sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, says, All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. All means all. Every one of us. You have sinned, I have sinned, our praise team has sinned, every single one of us, and that stands in between us and God. And listen, you don't have to think very hard to know that that's true. I've used this illustration before. It's my favorite illustration to just sort of capture the idea of we can, how we can see sin and understand that it's real. And so and if you've heard it before, just indulge me one more time tonight. If you have young children, toddlers I'm thinking about, 
Or you've been around them, you've babysat maybe young children that are 18 months, two years old, then you have seen the effects of sin firsthand. That child will take a cookie, and if you ask them, did you take a cookie? And they'll hide that cookie behind their back. And one cookie is never enough. And, and sharing is an absolute foreign concept. Now let me ask you something. As a parent or as the, maybe a primary caregiver of that young child, do you teach them that? No, we don't teach them that. Nobody teaches them that. In fact, if you're a parent, you spend the first 18 years teaching them not to do that. That, my friends, is sin. That's what drives them to do that, that inherent selfishness that is within each and every one of us. That is sin on display. And verse 18 here in John chapter 3 says that's our default state. That's how we come into this world in sin separated from God. And it causes us not only to want to take all the cookies, it causes us to be separated from Him forever. And Christmas shows us just how much God loves us. The lengths that He will go to show that love for us. See, all that stuff is true. You and I are sinners. We're separated from God. We don't deserve His love, not one of us. All of that is true. But it says He loved us so much that He sent Jesus. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That's why we celebrate at Christmas. God with us, a baby born in a manger that came for you and came for me, that we might be reconciled to God. The first reason we celebrate Christmas is because it shows that God loves us. The second reason is this, God came to us. Can you imagine that? That's an incredible truth, that God came to us. It says there that for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. And that word gave there, it means to give as a gift or to supply what is required. What's tremendous about that is that God, He is the one that we sinned against. He is the offended party, and yet He took the initiative to reach down to us. He took the initiative to make the way for us to have a relationship. That's an incredible truth. Over in chapter 1 of John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, it says, The Word, Jesus, became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. I mentioned earlier that all of us have sinned against God. We see toddlers, and we know that that is true. God is love, I mentioned that as well, but He is also holy. He is also righteous. And because of that, He's perfect in all of His ways, His love, His mercy, His grace, yes, His holiness and His righteousness. And because of that, He can't turn a blind eye to sin. He can't pretend it's not there. He can't just say, oh, you know what, I just love Him so much, it just doesn't matter. He can't do that in His holiness and in His righteousness. Over in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death, eternal separation from God. Now, I realize that at this point, you might say, that's not really the warm, fuzzy, feel-good Christmas Eve message that I was expecting tonight. But that's the reality, that's the truth. But here is the good news of Christmas. Yeah, the wages of sin is death, but here's the good news that we celebrate. God came to us because we could not get to Him. There's nothing that we can do. We can't amass enough good works to make Him ever forget the reality of sin that is within us. And that's the good news of Christmas. He came to us because we couldn't get to Him. He came and took on the form of a man so that He could live a perfect life, so that He could go to the cross and pay the penalty for your sin and for mine. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That God loves us. That God came to us to provide a way that we can come to Him. And then the third reason we celebrate Christmas is because of the tremendous gift that God offers us. Look there at the last part of verse 16. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Think of the greatest gift you've ever got for Christmas. Think about that for a minute. What's the best gift you ever got for Christmas? I will tell you, I am the worst gift giver in the world. We took the five love languages quiz, you know, and one of the love languages is gift giving. I think I got a zero on gift giving. Absolutely miserable. My wife is a saint that has put up with 35 years of my horrible gift giving. But think of the greatest Christmas gift you ever got. One of the reasons we celebrate Christmas is this tremendous gift that God has given us. While that first part of Romans 6.23 is incredibly bad news, the last part is incredibly good news. The first part says the, the wages of sin is death. The second part says this, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And the word believe here, John chapter 3 says the only thing we have to do to accept that gift, whoever believes in Him, that word believe, It means more than just a simple acknowledgement of facts. It means to trust something to fulfill its purpose. When you came in here tonight and you found your seat, you believed in that chair. Now, you didn't just believe that it was there. That's true. But you trusted in that chair to fulfill its purpose that you wouldn't end up sprawled out on that floor tonight. And that's what that word means. And what what John... 3.16 tells us is the only way that we can receive this gift, the only thing we have to do is to believe, to trust that what Jesus did was enough. That's our only response. Think of those presents that are under your Christmas tree. Maybe they're there now. Maybe they'll, they'll only be there tomorrow morning. Certainly there'll be a lot more there tomorrow morning. And when you go and look at those gifts, some or many of them are going to have a tag on it with your name. Now, you have a choice to make at that moment because that gift, it's addressed to you, but it's really not yours until you acknowledge it, until you accept it, right? I mean, you could look at that gift, pick it up, and see your name on the tag and put it down and say, I don't want it. I'm I'm not going to accept that. It's really not yours until you acknowledge it, until you receive it. God's gift is the same way. He offers us the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. The greatest Christmas present we'll ever get. The opportunity to have our sins forgiven. The opportunity to be reconciled to God. But that tremendous gift isn't ours. Until we acknowledge our sin. The Bible calls that repenting. Until we acknowledge our sin. And we receive the forgiveness that Jesus offers. So I'm glad you're here tonight. I'm glad we came tonight and had this opportunity to worship together to celebrate the the coming of our Lord, to celebrate His birth, and all of the reasons why we have to celebrate Christmas. Because it's a reminder that God loves us. It's a reminder that He came to us, and it's a reminder of this tremendous gift that He's offered to us. Max Lucado wrote a book called Prayer, A Heavenly Invitation, and he said this in the book. He said, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, he'd carry your picture in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. And whenever you want to talk, he'll always listen. He could live anywhere in the universe, and yet he chose your heart. And what about that Christmas gift he sent you in Bethlehem? Face it, my friend, God's crazy about you. And the reason we celebrate Christmas is because it shows us just how much God loves us and what He's done to restore us. Now, maybe you've never understood Christmas quite like that before. Maybe as as you have watched all the Christmas movies, you thought that's all it was about, spending time with family and restoring relationships. Maybe you've never understood Christmas quite like this. In a moment, we're going to end our service and we're going to turn all the lights off and sing Silent Night by Candlelight. But if you have some questions... Or if you'd like to talk with someone about how you can have this incredible gift of forgiveness and eternal life in Jesus, I'll be available after the service. I'll hang out right here for just a few minutes and just come down front and just simply tell me this, I need to know Jesus, I want that gift. 
I want to wish each and every one of you a very wonderful Merry Christmas. We're glad you came tonight and glad we had an opportunity to worship together as a church family. As you gather together with your families tonight and tomorrow, I hope you have a tremendous holiday celebration, remembering that Jesus is the reason we celebrate. I'm going to ask our praise team to come on back up. And as we close our time together, we're going to light up these candles. We're going to turn off all the lights and sing Silent Night by candlelight. We light these candles to remind us that Jesus is the light of the world. But just a word of instruction, go ahead and stand. Just a word of instruction on these candles. We're going to come around and light, bring the light to you. Bring the unlit candle to the lit one so that we don't drip wax all over the floor. So Isaiah 9, 6 and 7 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Wait.
holy night, wondrous star, lend thy light with the angels. Let us sing. Savior is born, Christ the Savior is born. Do you have questions about your relationship with Jesus or how you can have that incredible gift that God offers? I'll be available after the service. If you're a first-time visitor with us tonight, I hope you had an opportunity to fill out that yellow slip and just drop it in one of the offering plates on the way out. There is a blue bin out here in the fellowship hall. Just drop all of your candles in that as you depart from the service tonight. And if you're sticking around to help us deliver the cookies on the base, we'll just circle up here in the fellowship hall for a few minutes, and then we'll head out to the base. We're glad you joined us tonight. Glad we had an opportunity to spend this time together. I wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas. Now, as we blow the candles out, you can pull your mask down just a minute to do that. Um, cover it over. Be careful that the wax doesn't drip on the floor. Blow them out very gently. Good night and Merry Christmas to you. And just an announcement, if anybody wants a family picture next to the Christmas tree, Elliot will be out there taking pictures. And take your masks off for them, please. <laughs>